Hello, I'm Deb Mathias from the BUILD Initiative and the director of the QRIS National Learning Network. Before we begin our session, I'd like to thank the Alliance for Early Success and our other generous funders for making this learning community possible. We began this series for state quality administrators and leaders to support their essential work within states around early learning systems building. Quality administrators are welcome to invite other participants as related to the specific topic of the call. We know several of you invited colleagues interested in policy and other cross-sector partners such as Head Start collaboration directors, education partners, and early intervention providers. We have, the co we have colleagues on the call from over 22 states and territories. We intentionally keep the session small to invite conversation and sharing. We hope these calls enable us to illuminate challenges, innovation, and promising practices. After the session, a survey will pop up asking for your suggestions, comments, or questions. We appreciate your input and ideas about this session and we'll follow up with resources as requested. Also, thinking ahead, let us know if you're working on a promising practice or facing a challenge in your state systems building. Send me an email and we can develop a Let's Talk discussion around the topic. Thank you for taking the time to answer the questions when you registered for, for the session focusing on the S in QRIS how California is using QRIS to dive deep into early childhood systems development. Many of you provided thoughtful ideas and questions, and we reviewed the information, and it's informing the presentation. In fact, our first question was, is your primary focus the R as in rating, the I as improvement, or the S as in systems from QRIS. So I was um, interested in the results. Rating received 7% of the responses, improvement 53%. And I was kind of surprised at this last one. System development got a 28% hit. So people are thinking systems development improvement. I found it fascinating that rating as the focus of the QRIS was the smallest entry at uh, 7%. I found that interesting. I think years ago when we began working in QRIS, people were thinking more about how do we rate programs, um, how do we use metrics and measurements that are reliable, and there was a lot of focus for accountability on the rating. And it's interesting for me over the years to see the development toward systems work and improvement work um, being the focus of the QRIS. So another question that we asked up front was, how much has your state used QRIS to drive systems change? And 43% of you said extensively. Another 33% of you said moderately. Slightly was 16%. And haven't tackled that very much at all was 7%. Again, interesting for me to think about um, systems change as being um, a real focus and part of the QRIS work. Well, we're just about ready to get started on our presentations, and we'll start with a section on um, laying out the foundation of the work in California and then two specific examples from two of the regions. Make sure to keep track of your questions and examples during the session for our discussions throughout um, as we go along. Enter your thoughts and ideas in the chat box so we can reference those and bring other thinking from other states into the conversation. We'll begin with the spark about the general context and to set up the um, the California presentation. I'd like to introduce our speakers today, Sarah Neville Morgan, um, who is the Deputy Director at First Five California and focuses on using research 
and science to influence the early childhood systems work and policy and program development and con continuous quality improvement aspects of systems. Then Cecilia Fisher Doms is the administrator of the quality improvement office in early education and support division of the California Department of Education and responsible for California's early learning foundations, quality improvement activities that are described in the state's CCDF state plan and Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge grant. We're also um, excited to have today with us Krista Murphy, who is the coordinator at the Orange County Department of Education, where she leads Quality Start QRIS, which supports over 300 publicly funded private and faith-based early learning programs and 70 family child care homes. And Kathleen Guerrero is the executive director of the first five El Dorado and has over 30 years of experience in the early learning and care and education field. We'd like to welcome them all today. And I think one of the things for me that's so interesting about the California approach is that they've really worked in the context of the policy, economic, and diversity of California to craft a QRIS with a state level rubric which allows a lot of flexibility and development at the regional level. And um, I think that no matter what state you're from, you're going to find something in here that's interesting and can be taken into your own context and your own thinking about the development of your QRIS system and early learning systems development. So without further ado, I'd like to turn facilitation of this discussion over to Cecilia fisher -Doms. Um Thank you, Cecilia, and welcome today. Uh, thank you, Deb. I'm happy to be uh, part of this conversation and to uh, express what California is doing in terms of its systems work related to QRIS. Um, we, um, so we have already identified our, our speakers and I'm going to move on to um, what makes our approach so interesting. So we, California started with Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge Grant and we implemented a, uh, an approach that was unique from our other early learning um, challenge uh, colleagues or other states in that we built a system of locally driven QRISs where local consortia, and that's what we call them, are those entities and constituencies that are coming together, made the decision to speak the same language and agree on a common set of quality standards across the state. Uh, this approach builds upon decades of local and statewide successes to create capacity at the local level to meet the needs of our early learners with a focus on those with high needs. It supports locally driven decisions um, around how consortia improve the quality of programs in their communities. It encourages regional assessment of programs local goal setting based on their respective communities' needs, and monitoring of local programs' progress on moving the dial, the needle um, on quality in their own communities. Um, California's focus is on better outcomes for children, which is why we are placing the importance on the effectiveness of teaching and adult-child interactions observation tools that inform curriculum planning, and teacher edu education and professional development. Our Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge, which started um, the application back in 2011 and just finished this um, past December, um, put us in an interesting position. When that um, Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge application came out, we had um, a number of people across the state who were encouraging us to respond um, 
However, there were several challenges that we faced. One, that the application needed to be a governor's application and that we needed to have a statewide quality rating and improvement system. Um, and one of the things our governor was said was that, you know, you couldn't have a statewide one. So within that challenge, we created a concept paper that turned into an application which we managed to get our governor uh, to sign um, nearly at the last minute. Um, in December of 2011, um, California received an approval from our Federal Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge grant application um, with um, a caveat that we have some common tiers. Uh, so in January of 2012, California was officially awarded $52.6 million uh, for our federal um, grant competition. And uh, this was then rewarded to states that created comprehensive plans to transform early learning systems for children birth uh, through age five with better coordination and assessment mechanisms clearer learning standards, and meaningful workforce development and family engagement uh, initiatives. As a grant requirement, California had to commit to adding at least two common tiers to its locally based QRIS framework outlined in its application. We did, in the application, have our licensing as the floor, so we had that common tier. Um, we did agree to do that. And so of that 52.6 million of the original award, um, approximately um, three quarters of, that, of those funds were um, awarded and distributed to our local consortium, which were a voluntary network of 17 regional consortia in 16 counties. Yes, we, it's 16 counties because we had two in Los Angeles. Um, and these were operating or were on the cusp of operating a QRIS. Um, these in turn over time became 30 consortia because we were able to get additional funding that brought us up to 75 million. There were 14 um, additional mentees um, bringing us to 30 consortia. So then in, um, when we started this, we started with um, nearly 500 sites. And by 2015, our number had increased by nearly 600% to 3,278 sites. In uh, 2012, when we started, we had a little over 1,500 children who were participating. Uh, in participating sites, and by 2015, we were serving um, nearly 125,000 children. Um, these statistics really illustrate um, the amount of, of ramping up that we were able to accomplish in that short amount of time. Um, clearly, not every provider was immediately enticed by participating in QRS. Um, and we recognize that particularly for family child care home providers, they were anxious about being rated, and uh, it took a bit more time to develop those relationships to engage them more fully. Um, there were definitely strong partnerships that were created in this process between our state and local levels. Uh, the building of the uh, uh, building and strengthening these partnerships across the early learning field, um, child health, and family strengthening were really very significant. Because of the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge grant, agencies um, at both the state and local levels across uh, our state um, started to work together in a truly collaborative way, which was really unprecedented for our, uh, for our field uh, here in California. Um, a, a huge accomplishment of this grant um, was that it provided a platform for a common language to speak on what quality really looks like across programs. And since California made the leap to apply for Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge funding, 
it really created a quality system in which Cal uh, in California that really did not exist before. It laid the foundation for the state to invest um, in its system um, that we ha hadn't been seen before. It created an inclusive quality system uh, and a highly visible platform for um, a conversation about co quality between providers, families, legislators, our um, state participating partners, and other partners. As we've described it, we identify it as an umbrella um, in which the individual pieces fit together and all providers are, are part of this process. Um, it builds um, a, an infrastructure that supports increased efficiencies. This is particularly important in um, developing the capacity across the state for training technical assistance, for assessing and improving the quality of our early learning programs. Um, in, a, in a later slide, we'll um, describe this ramping up process and the developing the capacity for our um, environment rating scale uh, assessors for um, the building of capacity also in terms of class and we'll see how that really worked to create a, a statewide assessor management system which was truly critical for us to have state master anchors that responded to local assessors. And then lastly, um, uh, with a, a clear quality standards as uh, common language that required a focus on um, adult-child interactions and family engagement. Um, this provides families with a, clear, with a clear understanding of quality standards that we hope will help them make informed decisions and that also um, gives providers clear goals to attain and also a pathway for um, doing so. So California has 58 counties. Um, as we mentioned, Race to the Top uh, Early Learning Challenge provided the, the process for us to get there. So if you can identify on the slide, you'll, you'll notice that the, um, those that are outlined in green are those first 16 counties. And then with the supplemental funds, uh, which brought us to the 75 million, that extended to another 14 counties, and those are in um, that orange. Um, then California did something pretty historic in that it actually put into statute 50 million ongoing for state preschool QRIS. Um, and, uh, and also, it, right now, it's been um, uh, two years of $24 million for an infant toddler QRIS, which expanded it then to another uh, 45 of our 58 counties. And then with our colleagues at First Five California, they launched their impact program, which extended it through all 58 counties. Um, so we now have um, over 88 million annually in state funding for QRIS. This year that's over um, 100 million um, because we will be, um, and we will be losing our one-time infant toddler funding. Um, we, do ha we are putting some funding into our um, state um, CCDF funding to continue to do um, some of that infant toddler QRS funding, it's just not as robust as we were able to do with that one-time funding. Um, so we have actually moved from our Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge to um, a state QRIS system that um, has really addressed the issues of sustainability um, that we faced um, with the sunsetting of the Early Learning Challenge Grant. Um, and we think that this is really pretty remarkable for us to have accomplished in these last five years. And I'm going to uh, hand it off to my colleague, Sarah Neville Morgan, to show what this now California QRIS looks like. Thanks so much, Cecilia. So what I'm going to cover is 
diving into the actual system building part of it. And one of the opportunities that we got when we decided to add first five funds into it as well as getting additional funds through the legislature that went to the Department of Education to put out, we could take a step back and really say, all right, now let's truly knit this together as a system. And I can't say that we weren't already doing that through the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge because we were. It, it, there were definitely uh, frames of it and pieces, but we will all say we were also building the plane while flying it, um, although I think most of our counties would say we're still doing that. But it did let us take a step back again and say, how can we keep putting this together in a way that brings everybody along where they are? And what we did was really look at the early childhood system building, which is defined as the ongoing process of developing the structures, behaviors, and connections that make all the components of an early childhood system operate as a whole to promote shared results for children and families. And we really deeply pulled from the BUILD initiative, their early childhood systems working group model, and looked at, uh, you can see just from the slide that we have up, looked at all of their work as a way to frame what we were doing with our consortia here. So in order to reach these results and put together the system, you'll see we have the system's functions. And as typical for California, we had to Californiaize it. So instead of six system functions, we have seven. And we changed some of the names a little bit as well. Um, for our consortia so that they could see themselves in it a little bit better. But those systems functions not only go around the entire system itself, but then also are mirrored within the QRES, which really lets us dive deeply into some of this work, especially around the quality improvement aspect of it and looking at how partners have worked together, looking at the different funding streams and how they need to come together. As we look more at financing strategically, we're really moving ourselves along to a place where we're prioritizing funding that reflect our values a little bit more. So if we really think um, adult-child interactions are the most important thing, how are we supporting that over, as Deb said earlier, a lot of us now are moving away from the rating as being our highest value and the highest place that we put in the dollars. But I think as we look at where dollars go, that tends to take up a huge amount of the system. So we are trying to look at financing strategically and shift more and more dollars into the eye and ensuring that the improvement part really is getting what it needs. So one of the other parts I want to say on this is that in order to be more intentional, we took those systems functions and not only wove them throughout the entire QRIS, but we also made it part of the application process. So as our counties or consortia were applying, they had to address each of those system functions, and then they provide an annual update in their performance reports. We're also designing our TA so that it both supports them locally in addressing those system functions, but it also is addressed to the state and the state system functions. So as you can tell from this call, California QRIS is not only a partnership and implemented between the state and the counties and regions, but it actually is across two major state agencies. So the way the California Department of Education and First Five California have to come together to jointly support this work really becomes something that we have to focus on at the state level to make sure that we're making it easier and flow better at the local level. So that's just something that we are all continuing to look at as we build our system. So I am trying to move the same. There we go. So to help you put this together and see the relationships, we actually created this slide for our legislature and some of our policy work, but it, it has been helpful for everyone, from our own staff out to the consortia, and it really shows the different layers and how the flow between the California QRS works. So at the top of the slide, you'll see that we have our rating matrix and implementation guide. And there are three common tiers across all the consortia that they all follow. And they all also have the same elements in them that they're focused on. We also have a continuous quality improvement pathways that is our companion to our rating matrix. And we really say they move together. And that came through a process where originally we had a rating matrix that was a little bit more robust and heavy with elements to rate. 
and through a pruning process where our consortium really focused on the few and powerful, they moved off elements that were more uh, subjective, that weren't easily rateable, um, or didn't have a lot of research behind them and put those on the pathway so we could focus on improvement, but we weren't dependent on rating them without a good way to actually measure them objectively. Those guide all of our work. In the middle, we have that California QRS Consortium, which represents all of our counties that are coming through with 48 different consortiums. And then under them, they have 10 regional hubs, which is what you saw in Cecilia's slide. Um, actually, you're going to see in a slide in a couple minutes. And those 10 regional hubs help provide some structure, create efficiencies, coordination amongst the consortia that are in those regions. We also have work groups, and our four work groups currently have representatives from each of the consortia hub areas, so they determine who will be on them. They're staffed by, jointly between the California Department of Education and First Five California, and then we have a support partner through a contract with WestEd to help provide some facilitation and resource support and get us experts so that we can dive deeply back into the rating matrix to relook at our continuous quality improvement pathways to help us design the evaluation and to help us with communication strategies as well as coming up with a logo, um, a tagline, all those sorts of things. So when we say that this is a partnership, it truly is. What we have created through California Curious is not a one-way, this is what it is, do it model, but truly a way for locally them to tell us what's working, what's not working, let their values and principles be part of the conversation, and then they drive what ultimately comes out of it. We also have a planning committee that has representatives from the consortium as well as a few other statewide agency reps, um, not state agency reps, but representatives that might be an association or someone else like that. And they help us plan our consortium meetings. Through this membership process, they actually drive that rating matrix and what's on it, and which is why they're driving the process to relook at it, and have a voting structure where they actually, any change on the rating matrix, any change on how it's going to be implemented and looked at is governed by them, and they make the ultimate decision around, yes, we're going to now streamline this element or uh, totally remove an element. That will come through a, uh, a voting process through the consortium. Next, I'm going to show you a little bit about how the funding actually weighs into it. And I'll try to speed up a little because I know actually the most interesting part of our conversation is always the local consortium. So with First Five Impact, our funding from First Five California, which is $190 million with, um, that required a local match as well, so that the, the 190 is matched, goes out in a couple of different buckets. So the biggest one, $122 million, goes directly to our local consortium to help them as they implement this work. That $122 million also has some incentive funds that really help them target some of the populations which our state commissioners felt were a high priority. So if they go beyond their targets and actually serve more sites, they're eligible for additional dollars, especially if those sites are serving infants and toddlers family child care, children with disabilities and other special needs, and tribal and migrant sites. So those came up as just a really high priority for us at the state commission level. And a way to help prioritize that at the local level was to allow for incentive funds. We then put $25 million into the regional area to really help those regions come together and have specific dollars to help them coordinate, look at TA across them, look at data systems across them, and some other pieces. And $16 million went into evaluation. So as part of our state mandate that created First Five and First Five California, we are required to do evaluation, which actually is such a luxury that we have dedicated funding that we must use for evaluation purposes. And as I said earlier, the evaluation work group is helping us design and think through what that evaluation should look like. And then we put $27 million into statewide training and technical assistance. And you'll see some of those buckets under that. 
but it also uh, allowed us to invest in infrastructure development so that as we start to look at something like coaching and coaching standards across California, we can create the base of what all coaches need to know and understand and how they would implement that effective coaching, and then that can be layered on top with specific co coaching content, as many of our consortia have already developed a lot of coaching content. All right, I'm going to go to the next slide, which is actually CDE's funding. So Cecilia, you want to take it back over? I'll, I'll just jump in here for a moment. So the Department of Education I had mentioned earlier um, received $50 million annually um, for a state preschool QRIS block grant. Um, that's particularly because the state of California has um, separate funding for um, education, and so that, that specifically goes into our state preschool funding um, and supports that, which is actually a good foundation from our Race to the Top earlier in Challenge. Many of our state preschools were a part of that. Um, also, our legislature, or I say advocates, were successful in um, getting um, $24 million over um, a two-year period for an infant toddler QRS block grant, which goes out, and, and that's obviously broader than just our state contractors. For anyone who is serving infants and toddlers, we're looking to backfill with some of that out of our child care and development fund quality dollars. Um, out of our current quality budget, we um, have set aside $2 million for um, QRIS certification grants to the um, uh, 10 regional hubs um, and to support um, whether that's uh, the ERS family of tools, assessors, class assessors, uh, various ones on, on the tools and professional development systems that we use and so to extend local capacity. And then, of course, the quality improvement funds out of the CCDF, uh, the lion's share of those uh, professional development systems are aligned with the QRIS. And there are programs that I think nationally people would know with the program for infant toddler care. And then other systems that we um, work to ensure that those complement and support the local QRIS and that uh, a priority for services goes to those programs who are, in fact, participating in their local QRIS. So in, um, I was going to say, Sarah, with the first five California, was able to kind of come up with one number. I don't, I'm not quite as easily able to come up with one number, but it's, it's a hefty investment there. <laughs> so we'll move back to you, Sarah. Great. Thanks, Cecilia. And I, of course, forgot to say part of what we're most proud of, of the First Five Impact part of the funding stream, which was that we intentionally were able to design it to be as inclusive as possible. And we call it our on-ramp to quality at a couple different levels. One, all of our counties were able to participate. So we've had counties from 2005 participate with First Five California in matching funds programs around quality preschool initiatives. And those counties really were already so much farther along and were the ones pulled in for race to the top, et cetera, because they had been focused in the quality improvement area for so long. But we had other counties who weren't as far as long and continued to sort of be left out of more competitive funding streams. And what we wanted was an opportunity to make it more equitable and to assure all counties, no matter where they were on this CQI and systems building process, that they could join. But we also wanted to make it inclusive all, of all settings. So that's the other part around our inclusivity, is that the first five impact part of California Curious funding can help a variety of settings. We allow alternative settings, those that might be doing more school readiness activities or home visiting with families, uh, family, friend, and neighbor programs and outreach, family child care is a high priority for us, all the way up to the state preschool and Head Start type programs. So it really does, in California, create a curious which is much broader than some other states might have. And it has dedicated funding streams that go out through the Department of Ed to focus on California state preschool program. And then First Five Impact funds come and wrap around that and expand the continuum that can participate in what we call California QRIS. And through that, you have some sites that really are engaged in a full QRIS and others who are just 
I say just, but it is a lot, engaged in the improvement efforts but aren't engaged in the rating part. And so that continuum really does say getting everybody in all early learning settings to be high quality for children no matter where they are is our priority. So I wanted to make sure I address that. As we look at supporting the quality and building system from the California Curious Consortium, then going into our statewide training and technical assistance and how we develop that infrastructure that you heard me talk about, then looking at our coordination and training and technical assistance hubs, then the statewide resources and quality projects that Cecilia brings, and then this part that we're really excited at the state level about, and I hope the consortia is just as excited about, is how through multiple funding streams we're actually aligning data and reporting requirements. So our first step in that was coming up with common data elements so that all the consortia, whether they be using block grant funds or first five impact funds, are using the same data elements and they will report those once. They go into First Five California and we share them with the Department of Ed and it really works so that they're not doing multiple uploads, figuring out where to put stuff, but here's our one data upload around that. And what we're working on next is how we have an annual reporting form that works across all of us no matter what, so that they once again don't have to do multiple reports to multiple um, sort of funding streams. Um, so that's the next piece that we're working on. As we look at our California Care Systems Evaluation, I'm just going to touch on this very quickly, but what we are doing is using the Kaufman framework to really help guide that work and look at QAS in California across the landscape. And what that helps us do is through that systems lens, look at the context of the implementation, the components, where are all those connections, what is the infrastructure and what does, um, what's needed there, and then how are you taking that to scale across the state. So all of those pieces really do lend themselves well to a systems framework. And now, before we transition to actually hearing from our locals who do the, the hard work on the ground, I wanted to show you what our consortium regions look like. As I said earlier, there are 10 regions across the state, and those regions actually have a variety number of consortium in them. So our largest one you'll hear from in a minute which is our Region 3, and that has the most amount of counties. I think it has 14. And then we have two regions that are actually a single county region. And you may say, well, how would you do that? Well, one of those would be LA, and LA is actually larger than most other states. So the number of children they have, the number of sites they have, the number of partners they have really do make it that their systems work just across that county is more complex than it would be across several other states. So we left them to really deeply focus on LA, and we did the same with San Diego because of the number of programs and children and partners in all of those regions. Uh, we also said before that they get a way to vote, so they themselves through their governance structure determined that they would have three voting representatives and those votes help us with things like adjustments to the rating matrix. So that is the state level part of the system. Um, we are still working on all of it and continue to dive back in. What we had promised our consortium was after a little over a year of trying this out that we would do our continuous quality improvement and say what's working, where would we like to make some adjustments, do we have any other suggestions? And then continue to provide some TA as we work together on this. So our September consortium meeting will really help focus on this. And we're so excited that we're going to have two experts with that, us on some of those conversations. So we're bringing in Abby Thorman and Garrett Westervelt to help us think through that, um, that work. So I think next you have a pause for us, Deb, before we move into the actual consortium region level. Yes, I do. We, your presentation has taken a very complex state with a lot of moving parts and partners, um, and your presentations really made it very clear and um, exciting to a number of the people on the call today. So I have just a couple of questions. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the regional coordination T and TA hub. Maybe if I go back to this slide, like 
what's different that's happening in that regional coordination TNTA hub, it's not technical assistance. I see statewide TA is up above that in the gray box. So can you talk a little, parse that out a little bit for us? Sure. So some of what we've tried to do, because although some of our pieces stay up at the state level and some are at the consortium level, there needed to be something in between in a state that's such as large and complex as California. And we wanted to make sure instead of creating sort of databases and anchoring systems in every consortium that we could create some efficiencies. So through the first five impact funding stream and then through some certification grant dollars that CDE was able to get, we invested in the regional area to coordinate some of those pieces. So they coordinate their anchors around ERS there. They also have a dedicated amount of funds that they can use for Teachstone, and those are supposed to help them determine how many class assessors they might want. Is there specific class-related TA, such as MMCI, that they would like some of their coaches in that region to go through? So they have some dedicated funds that they can use to help create coordination and efficiencies across them. And then as we move forward with some of this statewide TNTA infrastructure, some of what will be developed there will then be to help train and provide support to the hubs so they can carry it forward. So instead of creating something and then keeping it up at the state level, our intention really is to say, here are resources. We'll keep with sort of the standards and accountability, but give you the more fun part of helping implement them and ensure they work with your local systems. That's just such a great structure with the state providing almost the support um, to the locals doing the work in the trenches. But and knowing California and the way you all think about this, I'm sure that at the same time, the regional TNTA hubs are informing your development of the support for areas of the state that aren't as far along and that um, because there's a lot of invention going on here, obviously um, on the ground level as well as the state level. That That's is, just great. Yeah, Go that ahead. is true. And we have some of those counties that we call more newbies and trying to partner them up with counties who may be more steeped in this work so that they can really mentor each other. And I have to say, everybody brings a different nuance to it. So one of the strengths of this local model is that there are things that are happening that would never happen if it were just state-driven. And so both Kathy and Kristen, in a few minutes, will be able to highlight some things that whenever I find out about them, I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys just made my week. I love that you can do X, Y, and Z in your community through this curious frame and you can link them together. It is really neat to see how much local innovation there is. We did have another, and I know that this is probably a list that's 20 pages long, but can you just talk for one or two minutes about the data elements? Are, are there any big categories you could uh, share with us or do you have a document that would um, provide you know, more detail and anything about the data elements. So of course I don't have my data person sitting in here next to me, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> there are. Um, a book. <laughs> it's a huge book that uh, spells out each data element, but looks through not only the rating elements of it to capture that, but some specific things around the program setting a little bit around the children, families, and educators. We at the state, of course, had hoped for even more data, but data can also be a burden on local implementation as yeah. well as the programs. So it, having that dialogue and having the evaluation work group really be sort of a sounding board where they would say to us, uh, yeah, that's not going to work so well. Um, or we went back to our local communities and this is what we've heard. Can you help us think through this piece in a different way? That's invaluable. And the other part that we're now working on is investing in the workforce registry so that that can be a way to capture a lot of the more nuanced elements around the workforce and help support us with understanding more the educator piece of it. Well, that's great. I, we do have more questions in the chat box. 
but I want to make sure to hear from the um, local group. So I think I'm just going to I'm going to move forward, and we can come back if we have time. But I do want to make t uh, good time for these conversations as well. So I'd like to turn it over to Kathy at this point um, to talk about the Region 3 Hub and some of your work. Great. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here today. Um, as Sarah had mentioned, Region 3 is one of the largest regions in the state, and um, we, we, asked, we asked to be that way, believe it or not. Um, I think the vision was that we were a little bit smaller, but as Sarah pointed out, one of the greatest benefits of um, working together through Race to the Top is that there were some areas that or some counties who had developed deeper expertise than say the newbies and what we found when we went through our planning process that we were effective mentors. We, we liked working together, we liked to bring our partners along and that um, doing a region um, in a way that geographically made sense or that we partnered or shared resources worked best for us. So as a result we are 14 counties strong. Within the 14 counties, we have 11 consortia. Um, of the 14 counties, 50% participated in the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge grant. Um, four were part of the original grant application, and then three more, I'm sorry, four more counties were added during the term. Um, and that gave us our base of in infrastructure. And then the newer counties that came on through the impact process partnered with us to, to form the 14 county region. Within this region, um, our target is 819 children served, ranging from in the smallest counties five licensed sites, I'm sorry, 819 sites, ranging from the smallest county five licensed sites to 182 in our largest counties. Um, the lead agency for the region is First Five Eldorado Children and Families Commission, um, but we like to refer to ourselves as the collaborative lead, as Sarah mentioned, often in the presentation, the many funding streams, <laughs> there's a certain amount of um, navigation for, for systems in particular, whether it's um, looking at policy and how we move from a state to a regional to a local, whether we're leveraging blending, braiding funding streams. Um, it's nice to have someone on the front end of that, but our work would not be complete without the partnership we have with our County Office of Education, who is really the program lead in our work. Um, they're the ones who are the hands on the ground and build our team to actually go out to the 14 counties and 11 consortia. Um, our grant application is the basis for our decision making. We have a partnership agreement that each one of our counties sign that provides a framework for participation, our decision making, how we collect and report data. Um, this partnership is based upon our um, application, our grant application that we use to guide our work, and that within that plan provided by the grant application, we um, have arranged into sub-hubs. As you can imagine, with um, that large of a geography, simply having one large geographic region didn't make sense to us. So we broke into three smaller sub-hubs that allow um, the consortia to mentor. It allows us to share resources and develop plans that really allow full participation in the work that we do and are sensitive to local needs because some of our smaller counties have much different needs than maybe some of our more urban counties. Our training and technical assistance coordination is provided by our hub staff, and this includes having a, um, myself and our program lead at the County Office of Education, a program coordinator, and a program assistant. Um, Region 3 does have a database, this was actually a really big step for us, we have a database that is consistent across all consortia. We have individual URLs, so everyone has the um, safety or protection of their own data. However, the database is consistent across all 14 counties, which then feeds into that data report that, um, or the data elements that Sarah was just talking about. Um, for training and technical assistance within the region, we have currently designed after one year, we have QRS anchors that are contracted within the region that serve as our ERS anchor, and they have training in other relevant areas on the QRS matrix, such as the ASQ or other uh, Department of Education funded training programs. In addition, we have um, a class specialist who's helping our counties assess their class training needs and feeds into an overall class training plan for the region that guides us in our certification funding. And then we also have TA plans to meet local needs. We were also asked to share, um, in addition to our regional lens, what 
a county lens may look like as we um, drill down or dive deeper into our California QRIS. And so um, I wanted to share with you a little bit about El Dorado County's QRIS. Um, we have um, a front door, we'll call it. Um, we refer to our quality rating and improvement system as hi fi for quality One of the interesting things is different consortia across the state may have different names. And we are working on, um, as a state, providing a, um, some consistency in our look, but our county is referred to as HiFi for Quality. In California, we have what's called local child care planning councils. They are publicly appointing boards that operate under our open meeting laws. And their mission is to serve as the focal point for planning and development of accessible, affordable, and quality child care and development programs for children and families. It made sense to partner with them as our local lead since they had an organizational structure that promoted transparency in the community and provided decision making, especially in the area of quality child care. They have mandated representation that includes child care consumers, child care providers, both public and private community representatives, public agency representatives, and discretionary appointments that are made from our County Board of Supervisors and our Superintendent of Schools. Within our membership, you can see the logos on the slide. There are resource and referral agencies, our county, um, county departments and programs, and also our higher education participate in our consortia for decision making. Um, the consortia is a subcommittee of our local planning council. So this um, local Child Care Planning Council provides us the structure for local decision making, which I think is important to build upon existing systems rather than creating a new one. Also important is the um, ability to um, leverage, blend, braid funding as it comes down. In many of the slides that Sarah and Cecilia showed earlier, you can see the millions of dollars and pots of money that all trickle down locally. Um, one of the reasons why we create the front end of High Five for Quality is so that on the back end, we have the ability to apply funding to meet our QRIS deeds. So for example, um, our funding streams are organized to support the consortia priorities. The coaching and mentoring, um, we multi-fund up to five early learning mentors through Head Start monies, our CSPP money, and our first, local First Five money. We um, fund outreach to, to family child care providers um, through impact funding. We, our incentive funding is a combination, or collaboratively funded, through impact money at the state, Head Start, AB212, which is state money, CSPP Brock Grant, and then also our infant toddler funding. In training, we, we strive to map our existing trainings and um, coordinate them in such a way that if one agency is having a training, we open it up to other folks in the community so that we can maximize our training dollars. And then our coordination, including the database assessments and ratings, are really a combination of funding between our local child care planning council, our CSPP block grant, um, and um, impact and local first five dollars. As for the return on investment, um, El Dorado County was one of the original RTT um, grantees. We were one of the smallest in, in um, numbers, and in, in we have 187,000 population in our county. Um, and we were lofty <laughs> in what we wanted to do. What was it? Um, we always needed to be, I forget the right word, Sarah will correct me later, but it's achievable, ambitious yet achievable. And so um, through our RTT and then as a result of our QRS that's continued since, um, we have 55% of our licensed child care providers participating in our High Five for Quality program. Um, and that's been fairly consistent over the last four years. It's kind of like we hit the threshold. We got as high as 55%, um, but we're down at 55, I'm sorry, as high as 58%, but we're down at 55% of our licensed capacity currently. Um, the other thing to note is that the total number of licensed child care providers in our county has decreased nearly a third since the beginning of Race to the Top. So even if you get up to hitting capacity, sometimes your overall capacity takes a downturn and it's something that we have to balance in our quality improvement um, and talk about new strategies to engage folks or to maintain our licensed provider population as we implement. Um, and we assist providers in understanding the importance of providing high quality services without a high pressure approach. Um, families must understand the importance of high quality child care to choose from those settings. Um, our ratings are publicly available through our child care resource and referral agency. We empower providers to describe ratings through report cards in the areas of licensing compliance, child observation and assessments, child health and developmental screenings, teacher and director qualifications, teacher-child interactions and program development. 
um, I'm sorry, program environment. Providers have report cards and yard signs that they use to promote their work, and parents have access to the ratings, report cards, and educational tools such as brochures and then the vid Quality Child Care Matters video that you see on the slide. Reaching families in a rural community is best achieved by engaging our family child care per population. So the priority for us in outreach was really reaching our family child care providers. Um, we partnered with our El Dorado County libraries to have literacy staff um, develop story time curriculum based upon our California Preschool Foundations and free Frameworks. We refer to it as um, early literacy on the move. Um, they provide 12 visits a year, introductory, five mentor, five model visits, and a year-end visit. And they've also incorporated what they call books out on the move or boom books. They bring library books to our family child care homes for children to check out in a book bag system. Family engagement materials are included to extend the learning at home. And developmental in information, including ASQs this year, are provided through the book bag system. All families are referred back to their library hub for additional supports in developmental screenings, health, early literacy, parent education, and supports. I think that the most important thing that I can say about this partnership is that it, um, we looked at existing resources, we talked about how we could do something new, and looked at the um, expertise in our community, and it's really turned out to be an exciting innovation. And as you can see, um, nearly half of our participating sites in our QRS are family child care providers, and I'm confident it's our partnership with our libraries that's helped us get there. So with that, I would turn it over back over to you, Deb. All righty, thank you. This is just so interesting, the detail, and I can really understand and see how what you're presenting after hearing the state context is, is so interesting. Can, can you or Sarah um, address a little bit, we had a question about the infant toddler block grant. Um, it's not quite clear to the participants where that comes from. Is that the CCDBG infant okay. toddler block grant or something of so, a more level grant? Could someone address that? Yes, so Deb, this is Cecilia. And okay. the, yeah. um, the legislature put out um, 24 point, well, about 24.2 million specifically um, in um, two. Uh, support those programs that were serving infants and toddlers um, as opposed to the state preschool QRS block grant which was specifically set aside to a particular contract or particular program type in that in case state preschool. This is not a program type, it's for programs that are serving infants and toddlers, so whether that's centers or um, family child care. It can be used to support um, licensed exempt providers who are serving infants and toddlers and who would like to participate in their local QRS and to move them toward licensure. It's out of our state general fund uh, funding, but it does come to the Department of Education, um, and so we do have an application process. It went uh, out to any of the consortia that had um, a um, quality rating improvement system um, plan, um, and we will um, be issuing another one, but at a, a, a lower dollar value um, at this next round. You know, a grant like that, though, can really serve to jumpstart um, some of the initiatives and the baseline professional development, not only in the program level, but the implementing partner and TAPD level. So uh, that can be very valuable um, interjection of funds. Um, so thank you for sharing right. that. And I'll just add one more comment that yeah. what we do know for our state is that many, I would even say, for the most, most of our infants and toddlers are served in home-based settings. And we know from our Race to Top Early Learning Challenge data that our family child care home providers uh, were, uh, were a slim, a much smaller percentage through Race to the Top. So this is a way to also engage um, uh, family child care home providers um, and support um, their quality improvement, uh, particularly those focusing on infants and toddlers. And that really came through in um, Kathy's conversation. 
So, Kathy, if you're thinking about like the work that you're doing um, in your consortia and your area of the state, like what were you seeing the most innovation or development occurring? Like, what's really you know exciting everybody and some of the most interesting learning that you're that you're doing in your area? The most interesting learning on a regional or a local level? On on your on your level in your consortia in level. In consortia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think. Um, We've always worked well together, um, and, that, and that breeds create creativity. Um, I think what's the most exciting thing is that when times get tight or funding streams change, we step back and say, okay, how can we keep what's best for our community up front and then work on the back end of how we put pieces together? And that, that to me breeds innovation. So if we're Losing, for example, last year we started to see more of our family child care providers go back to the workforce. So our number of licensed providers has dropped. And our consortia, in the best interest of keeping our QRIS going, said, okay, how are we going to bring more folks into the field? How are we going to work together as a team to keep um, the number of licensed providers in our county? And together they developed a communications plan. They did recruitment events. They put out brochures. And they really worked together to increase the capacity um, of our, our license capacity in the county. So I, I think having a structure that is um, reliable, that gives voice, will breed innovation to address whatever challenge the, <laughs> the changing QRS landscape brings your way. Oh my gosh, that is such a great uh, answer. Thank you so much for sharing that point of view. And I think for all of us that have been thinking and struggling with sustainability, having a strong commitment you know, to the partnerships and the collaboration gets you through the tough times, right? And, um, and, and thinking about what's, what's needed and useful within and from hearing from community. So in such a big state like California, it's just so um, interesting and heartfelt, the community element and the community voice, provider voice, family voice in the work that you're doing. Um, you know, and that the innovation ideas and sharing of challenges and innovation is just going up and down through your system in such a fantastic way. Well, thank you for sharing um, um, your notes and your presentation. And now we'd like to move on to Krista to take it home for us. <laughs> and if you have <laughs> questions or something that you want to share or mention, please, for our participants, make sure to put it into the chat box. And okay, let's move forward. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm Krista Murphy. I'm representing Orange County, California, and we are also the lead for Region 9 hub that you see in the little map there. So we're about equal in size uh, geographically to Kathy's region, but where she has 700 counties <laughs> that she's representing, we only have four. So we are, um, and all four of our counties were part in one way or another of the original race to the top. So I'll kind of talk through how that worked and how that affected how we're operating as a hub. So if you look at the map, um, Orange County is the tiny little rectangle off on the far left there. And you'll see um, we are greatly dwarfed in size by the other three counties that we collaborate with. However, when you're looking at number of children and families, San Bernardino, Riverside, and Orange County all have approximately the same number of young children that we're working with. Um, Imperial County is a little bit more rural, and significantly fewer families living in Imperial County. Orange County was one of the original 17 race to the top counties, so we've had um, five plus years working on QRIS under our belt. When we joined the Race to the Top initiative, we had a very small locally funded QI system, but, but we weren't doing formal ratings and it was nothing like the robust QRIS that we developed through Race to the Top. So we definitely started that Race to the Top journey in Orange County from ground zero and built our system up. Um, Imperial, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties joined in as mentee counties when, as Sarah mentioned, we got that additional funding. However, they took the perspective of 
coming to our regional meetings, um, they, they worked with us in San Diego, and really learning a lot about what we were doing with QRIS and started having conversation with partners, um, but did not, did not start rating counties until, I mean, did not start rating participants until last year. So Riverside County has been rating programs starting last year, and then they've expanded with impact funding beyond state preschool this year. And San Bernardino and Imperial counties are, are building their systems and beginning to rate programs for the first time. Um, overall, we have uh, nearly 6,000 licensed providers between our four counties, and our targeted number of providers, that 610, just represents the impact-funded side of our QRIS funding. So if you think back to the slides that Sarah and Cecilia shared in the beginning, we really are dually funded in California between our first five and our Department of Education. So those 610 targeted providers represent our impact to targeted funding, and then um, it's probably about double that for our state preschool that we are supporting through our CSPP QRIS block grant funding. Um, so how are we operating as a region? When we met and started talking about what we wanted to do with our technical assistance funds, um, the other counties really looked to Orange to act in the mentor capacity to sort of them walk them through the journey that we had just taken through Race to the Top. So we accomplished that by conducting a needs assessment that we um, offer to each of the counties annually, and then that drives a scope of work. And like um, Region 3, the, the county leads meet frequently. We actually meet monthly um, to talk about QRIS business, to hear the reports from our work group members, and to talk about our scope of work and make any modifications needed. Um, we, we try to achieve group consensus. We did spend some time in the beginning mapping out a plan for voting in case we weren't at consensus, um, and so we're going to go by majority rule, but so far, knock on wood, <laughs> we've been quickly able to reach consensus on all of our plans um, for applying this funding through our county. So what we decided to do is really focus on building the R and the I in the QRIS, since three-fourths of our county are engaged in this work um, really with a fresh look. So, and, it, and looking at some of the questions that came in for the participants, I, I think um, it's, it, it will sound like a familiar place to all of you. So they are working on hiring their staff. Um, we are sharing job descriptions with one another. We're talking about roles that work really well to be shared and roles that really need to be isolated from one another within the structure of a QRIS. Um, we also are sharing things like um, meeting our public agency requirements to go out for bid on large contracts. We're piggybacking on one another's bid process where, where that works, and, and that's a huge time savings for us. And then we are sharing resources that we create with one another. So we are using things like Dropbox and Google folders to share recruitment flyers and coaching handbooks and assistance guides and things that we're all um, creating. So we have this really great sort of we're all using public funding, we're all trying to do this to support children and families, so anything that one of us creates we are sharing freely with the others in our region. And um, one of the, the things that I'm excited about that has emerged from this work is we are starting communities of practice that are region-wide. So we're going to launch that this summer. We're meeting um, for a week-long institute for all of our QRIS leads to do some more training and trainer training for trainers. Um, but we're also launching communities of practice, which will be groups of work-alike individuals in all four counties focusing on a particular topic. So the four that we have developed that we want to start with are a community of practice for the leads for the actual site rating, so everything that goes into collecting the data and hitting that final rate the site button. Um, we'll have a community of practice focused on how to best support family child care and their particular needs. We'll have a community of practice for coaching, so coaching supervisors and coaches can get together and talk shop and learn from one another. And then the fourth, um, area of focus that emerged was a community of practice around the environment rating scale tool, so assessors and folks who are providing coaching and technical assistance on that tool will have a chance to get together. 
Um, and we plan to kick those off at our summer institute, and then those groups will meet quarterly. And um, we do have you know, challenges of geography. So if you look at our region, San Bernardino, Riverside, and Imperial have some mountains and deserts to navigate in between um, their areas. So we do a lot of rotating where we meet so, so the far-flung groups can have their turn feeling refreshed at a meeting um, as, as part of our focus on equity for QRIS. We try to be equitable with one another as well. Um, but overall, it's, it's been really great to have this group to work with. We, we've gotten a lot of um, forward momentum, sort of the way Kathy was describing about innovations that bubble up and we can share with one another. And we've also benefited from each group, each county coming into this work with their own set of local priorities. So in the list of all the wonderful things that you want to tackle as part of a QRIS, each county has created their own um, priorities, and that really allows us to piggyback and sort of ride the wave, to use an Orange County <laughs> metaphor, of another county's work. So for example, Riverside had already done some significant investment with infants and toddlers and was planning a big infant toddler conference. So rather than each of the other three counties doing some parallel investments, we decided to work with them um, and they're expanding that conference to include our entire region. And that's a really simple but I think um, telling example of, of sort of how we're, we're able to piggyback on one another and benefit from each other's investments. So I wanted to give you an example. Um, since our region is really focused on building the, the rating and the beginning stages of the quality improvement, um, that's where we are as a region. As a county for Orange, that's where we were for the last four years. And I feel like now that we've built that foundation and we have a solid QRIS up and running, now we're able to focus attention on the S in QRIS. So um, to get back to Debbie's question earlier, the, the pre-conference question about which are you focused on, I think I would have had a different answer probably each year of our implementation. So the first couple years it was all about the R because you've got to get those systems in place and operating smoothly or um, you're going to have some very unhappy participants on your hands. And then all along, of course, we're all in this for the I, for the improvement piece. But once you get that R up and running, I think we quickly realized we needed to turn our attention to systems building, particularly since we're, we are looking at fluid funding, we're looking at funding sources that come and go, um, funding that is tied to state leadership that comes and goes. So we want to make sure that we are leveraging our systems that we have in place and moving along the process of um, I think we're on a journey from seeing where QIS can fit into our existing system. We're beginning to take our steps out of that and into how can we change our existing system to better fit the children and families, which includes a QRIS, um, but really, really looking at how we can modify what we're doing in ways that will make us more immune to funding reduction. So I think an example of that that I'd like to share with you is some work that we've done with our local Help Me Grow agency. And these slides here I'm borrowing from a presentation. If I can brag on behalf of my colleagues, they were just finalists in a national Help Me Grow Innovation Challenge competition. And they traveled up to Minnesota and actually won the competition and won um, $10,000 to help support this work. So I'm going to walk you through this project as an example of some systems change that we're engaged in in Orange County. So we've been a Help Me Grow County since before we had QRIS. Um, and if you're not familiar with California's rating matrix, we do have one of our seven elements focused on health and developmental screening. And that developmental screening piece has long been a priority for both our first five and our Office of Education here in Orange County. So that was one of the areas that we really focused on building up quickly for our QRIS participants. Um, we have a scale of one to five points for each element. And our pitch in enrolling new programs was always, uh, we will help 
put, we will help put the systems in place at your site level to make sure that you can get the five points on this developmental screening because it's really a high priority for our county to make sure that the children you serve are getting developmental screening and families are referred for resources. And we were able to hit the ground running with that thanks in no small part to Having Help Me Grow, which if you're not familiar with Help Me Grow, um, is a nationwide organization and they really focus on being a hub for families zero to five to call in and get referrals. Um, they can call in with their questions about their children's development or they can call in and say, I had a developmental screening done and, and we have some concerns for my child. And Help Me Grow maintains a database of all the resources in our county and they will refer to families. So rather than as QRIS leads um, trying to help each individual program know about all the resources that are available, all we had to do was say, we will send Help Me Grow to you to give you a training and information, so all you need to do is refer your families to Help Me Grow, and that piece of the puzzle is solved. However, we found that the approach that we took with our first round of participants, which were mainly um, state preschool programs, a few private programs, but the bulk of our, our early adopters were state preschools who were largely part of school districts. So they had a lot of infrastructure in place. Um, and the approach we took with supporting developmental screening was to provide the ages and stages questionnaire, the ASQ screening. Uh, toolkit and training to those agency leads so they could implement ASQ within their own program. So we had training for trainers. We provided the ASQ kits out to everyone. We helped them understand how to choose a correct screening interval for each child, give those to the families, collect them, score them, and then they were um, to share the results with families and refer families to help me grow. And we had huge success with this with our center-based programs. Um, I, I want to say about 95% of the programs in our QRIS were able to score at five points the highest level for that element, meaning that they were offering the screenings to families and following up um, with Help Me Grow referrals. However, we did not see the same results with family child care. So we put together our family child care um, support, coaching, and technical assistance group. And we had a couple brainstorming meetings with our county Help Me Grow leads to really dig into, okay, let's, let's take apart our system and understand exactly what we're doing here to support screenings and then look at where are the sticking points for family child care and where do we need to shift the system to make it more successful for them. So what you see on the slide here is on the left is our pathway that was successful for center-based program. And on the right is we realized um, one of the main sticking points for family child care was those, those ladies and gentlemen who operate family child care, they do everything. If you want to talk about wearing multiple hats, they are the program manager, the enroller, the tuition collector, the family outreach specialist, the school readiness nurse. I mean, they, they do everything. So they didn't have the infrastructure to be able to hand off some of this work the way a center-based program would. Um, and asking them to take the time out to learn a developmental screening tool and be the person distributing, collecting, and scoring those tools uh, was really getting in the way of all the other quality improvement work that they wanted to take on. Um, and Rachel, I'm just going to answer your question right here. Yeah, the ASQ was made available in English and in Spanish. So um, we were supporting them in their home language and learning the tool and sharing the tool with the families they served. But where we were seeing the problem was they were having difficulty managing, photocopying the tools, getting them out to parents, and scoring them correctly. So we really wanted to think about, okay, how can we look to existing systems? Um, we have a few nonprofits who operate screening networks. We, we considered um, doing a recruitment drive to have the family child care send their families to these regional screening events, but transportation tends to be an issue in the areas where um, the, the population that the family child care is working with. So one of the things that emerged when we were having the conversation with Help Me Grow is the idea of um, getting the screening tool available to use on a computer or a smartphone. And we did some research into um, our most at-risk and impoverished 
populations to see, you know, would it be appropriate to offer a smartphone or computer-based tool? And the data that we found suggested that the, the, by and large, the families that were being served in family child care do typically have access to a smartphone. And actually, a smartphone is more common than a computer in these households. So we looked at, you know, what can we do with making this tool available um, through an app or a smartphone, and realized that there was a resource that we had available to us that because we hadn't looked for it, we hadn't realized it was there all along. So the Brooks publisher who makes the ASQ tool available, by purchasing the ASQ kits, we already had access to offer them through their um, smartphone portal. So it, it, was an ex it was not an extra investment. It was just realizing that that was um, a tool that we had available that we hadn't tried to use before. So we started with a small pilot group of family, family child care operators and had them navigate through the smartphone tool and give us feedback on if they felt like it would be appropriate to share with families. Um, everyone loved it from the very beginning. So we shifted to, instead of trying to train the family child care providers on handing out the ASQ tool themselves, we took on the responsibility of creating some materials for them to use to distribute to their families, um, to share with them, explaining what the family, how to access the ASQ tool online, and how the system would work for follow-up for them. So this slide here shows the material that we created. So now instead of giving ASQ kits out to family child care providers, we're just providing them with this flyer in English and in Spanish to share with their families. It includes a link. We've trained the family child care providers on how to help families navigate to that link. And we're really excited about the idea of a parent completing the ASQ tool. If you're familiar with it, it's a it's a series of observations that they ask you to complete for your child. And a lot of times the parent needs to sit down and, and set up for the child to do that particular thing so they can answer the question, which you can imagine is a lot easier to do if you've got your smartphone sitting next to you on the carpet than running back to your computer and then running over to your child and saying, okay, now stack up some blocks and let me watch. So we were, we were really excited about the possibility of moving to this smartphone tool um, at the same time, our Help Me Grow agency, and I'm going to click back, our Help Me Grow agency had been working to create a system of shared information. So they were, had been spent the last two years working with local pediatricians and medical homes to get all the legal requirements put into place where all of the developmental screening results that flow through our Help Me Grow agency would be in a database that could be accessed by pediatricians and medical home. And that was really an effort to reduce the number of duplicate screenings and to make sure that the screenings that did take place, were, the information was getting into the right hands. Um, so when we had first talked about adding our QRIS sites into Help Me Grow, they, they accomplished that through a process of taking the ASQ results and paying a staff person to hand enter all of that developmental screening information so it could be in the database, which would then be shared with the pediatricians. So one of the exciting innovations that came from switching to this app-based version of the tool is because it's already electronic, that information feeds directly into the Help Me Grow database. So we just eliminated the need for them to try to fundraise for staffing to cover someone to type in results into a database. It is now being automatically uploaded. As soon as the parent completes the tool, the information is there to be shared. Um, so we provide these uh, flyers to the, the family child care participants with the link to the tool. And then here's a little uh, uh, graphic to demonstrate how the system works. So the family has a smartphone, the ASQ tool is made available to them in English and in Spanish. I do want to mention that in the letter we offer the option of still getting the paper tool. Um, and Help Me Grow will send that out to the family if they don't have a smartphone or they don't choose to do the screening online. So the family gets the, completes the ASQ tool, submits it, it is automatically scored. The results go to Help Me Grow. The Help Me Grow staff then has two different letters that they send as a follow-up to the family. One 
option for about 80% of the families typically is that your child seems to be on track developmentally. Here are some links to some activities that you can continue to do. And if you have any questions, um, you can always call Help Me Grow, and then they encourage them to continue to have regular visits with a pediatrician. And then the 20 or so percent of families that do show developmental concerns from the screening receive a letter saying, um, there, there was a couple of concerns, and we'd like to call and talk you through what those results showed and help connect you to services for follow-up. And then they follow up that letter with a phone call. And they actually, I think their protocol is three attempts um, for a family before they, they take a pause. Um, and at that point, we activate the family child care <laughs> person to please reach out to the family um, so Help Me Grow can follow up with them. And we have had tremendous success this first year of implementation. The number of completed screenings that we're collecting through family child care and the number of families who do connect for follow-up services has tripled, um, moving away from our old system. So our next steps, um, and this is a slide from where we shared this at the that nationwide Help Me Grow meeting. Um, we wanted to, to emphasize to all the participants there, and, and we were talking to an audience of Help Me Grow experts. So we shared with them the build map showing that QRIS is everywhere in the, in the nation. So we wanted to alert them um, as Help Me Grow leads to find out who operates the QRIS in their state and to reach out and see if they're interested in um, working on developmental screening that they may have funding or staffing that can work collaboratively with the Help Me Grow um, system. And then locally, what we are hoping to do is to move into um, take the lessons that we've learned that were driven by a need to better support family child care and then and then implement that system wide because what we discovered through the app is that there are a lot of efficiencies to going that digital route. So even though we had our centers humming along um, with systems that worked well for the paper screening, we, we are going to start collaborating with them to see how they might think about shifting their outreach to families to start using the digital version of the tool. And our ultimate goal in Orange County is to work with all the systems that touch families zero to five so we can start families from birth with a connection to this online screening tool where they'll get alerts every time it's a time for a new developmental screening interval. Your phone will buzz you and say, hey mom, it's time to do your 18 month ASQ screening. And they do those fun little activities. It gets uploaded to Help Me Grow. They get follow-up immediately, and they, they connect with both their early learning system and their pediatrician on those results. So I gave ourselves until 2020 to get that done. So we're, <laughs> we're narrowing in on that gap. But really for me, that, like, that's the stuff, like Sarah said, that, that gets me really, really excited because I, I feel like we made a big shift here in our thinking from how can we just refer programs to Help Me Grow because they're good at follow-up to how can we change the way all of us operate in order to um, be more effective with our systems. Well, first I have to say congratulations. That was just one of the most interesting things. And what I love was how you've taken this big state and you know, the funding, complicated funding, and the, all the complications, and you boiled it down to an example of how creating systems and really analyzing what you're doing and thinking about what's working on like the micro level can get to such better results for children and families. I just super appreciated that example um, in the context of the bigness of California and the numbers of families and children and players that you're talking about. That's really a congratulations on the award and I can certainly see how you uh, got to that. I really appreciate you sharing that. Well, I'd like to thank all four of our presenters today for your time and effort putting together the presentations and um, just how interesting the conversation was. Um, if you have questions to our participants afterwards, please email me or um, one of our presenters here for more information. This material will go up online and you'll be able to access it or forward it to your friends um, who missed today's uh, presentation because it certainly was 
extremely uh, terrific. And thank you again to all four of you for your contributions today to helping us all learn more and get better and better at what we're doing. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.